Well, greetings. Welcome to Crossroads Baptist Church for our midweek devotion for um, July 28th. I pray that this finds you doing well. A few announcements I want to give it to you before we conclude the uh, eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Uh, I communicated with Brother Randy White, our missionary here at Crossroads Baptist Church. He will be in Peru August 9th through August 20th. Let's be lifting him up for his travels and for his work that he'll be doing there. Let's continue to pray for our um, prayer needs here at the church, our uh, the sick, those who really need a special touch from the Lord, and and those who are discouraged uh, during our, untr our our troubled times that, that we're living in. Let's uh, let's pray that the Lord would lift us up as a church congregation and as a leaders and uh, and our leaders here at the church. Let's pray for them and lift them up also. So you uh, you may know the announcement or you may not, but due to the uh, the COVID spike that we've experienced in our area and it seems like in our state we have uh, made the decision here at Crossroads Baptist Church to close our sanctuary worship for a few weeks. We'll still present a, a Sunday devotion or Bible study um, via the web page, Facebook and YouTube and we'll also continue with our Bible study. So what you need to know is after today our next uh, digital presentation will be Sunday August 8th. Keep that on your calendars. We, we will have those videos ready beginning August 8th. And we'll do Sunday and Wednesday um, until we kind of get through this um, spike in the COVID cases. You say, Brother Jeff, why are you doing that? Well, we're doing that to protect our members. We're doing that to protect our visitors who come and worship with us. And we're also doing that as a responsible uh, citizen here of um, Farmerville and of the Rocky Branch area, of the Crossroads area, of course. And... Um, so we you know we're just we're, we're we're doing what we feel led to do, and I pray that you um, understand that and will uh, stay with us here and, and and watch the success of what God is still doing through the ministry here at Crossroads Baptist Church. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for loving your people, and I thank you for the ministry here at Crossroads Baptist Church. Lord, I thank you for our members, our visitors, and those who support this ministry, Lord. And I lift those up to you today, dear Lord. Our prayer request, Brother Randy, who will be traveling with mission work in Peru. Those who have been sick in our community with the COVID, dear Lord. Our children who are getting ready to go back to school, our parents, our teachers. Lord, we lift them all up to you today, dear Lord, knowing that you are a sovereign God, you are a holy God. And Lord, you, you want the best for us, and that is what you intend. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would be with us through this midweek devotion. Lord, speak to our hearts. Prepare us for this word, Lord. And I pray that you would keep your people safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul's letters, Romans chapter 8, perhaps one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament. I love it. It has spoken to me as we have studied through this for the last three or four weeks. And we will finally conclude with Romans chapter 8. One thing about our Bible study, our midweek devotion, we're in no hurry. I've, I've learned that if we keep a, a video to about 20 or 25 minutes, it seems to be more effective. You, you get more out of it. It's not long and drawn out. We don't do a whole lot of deep theological digging. We, we just simply present the word as Paul did, and we use common sense and the Holy Spirit to enlighten us to what he is speaking about. So let me read here verse 31 and 32, and let's begin. Paul writes, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, generously give us all things? What I want you to do here first is, is to understand the, the perhaps, probably the, the, the greatest chapter in the book of Romans, perhaps is a, a powerful chapter or, or reading in the New Testament. And what Paul the magnitude here that Paul is presenting is what he says here. He says, all these things that have been discussed. That's what he says. What then shall we say in response to these things? Well, the first thing we should ask as the, the, the writing in our Bible with the big question mark is, what are these things? And I want to share with you a few of the pointers of Romans chapter 8 so we understand what Paul is referring to. Number one, we've been, been adopted into the family of God. Verse 15 reminds us of that. Verse 17 reminds us that we are co-heirs with Christ. We're not doing this alone. Christ is with us all the way. We have received the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our final redemption. We find that in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. And our prayers are taken up 
by the Spirit and laid before God. Verse 26. Though a sinner by nature, we all have, we all are dead through Adam, but though a sinner through faith we have been acquitted of all wrong. We find that in verse 30 of chapter 8. And our future future glorification is so certain that God speaks of it as if it has already happened. That also is in verse 30. So this is what Paul has laid out for us. All these great promises. And the next thing that should hit us, the next thought that should come to our mind is, if God did all of this for you and I, for Christians, if he made a way for us, what does it matter who is against us? If God has did all these things, co-heirs with Christ, adopted into his family, a spirit that guarantees our final redemption, faith that has been given to us, and we exercise, though we're sinful, it acquits us of all wrong. This is the work that Christ did, the completed work that God has seen and our future glorification that it's almost like it's taking place now as we see in verse 30 so if God has done all these things to us for us what does it matter who is against us if we ever take life in that type of sense with that statement how much easier it would be perhaps to face the difficulties of life this is not a hypothetical scenario this is reality that Paul is talking about God is really for us what an encouraging word today. And even in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms 23, verse 4, Psalms 27, verse 1, I fear no danger, for you are with me, for God is with us. Psalms 56, verse 9, I know that God is for us. He is not against us. So even the Old Testament patriarchs and the writers there, they understood that God was for us. Since God did not spare his own son, as Scripture says, but delivered him over to death, would he not guarantee us his promises of this precious gift he has lavished upon us? That's the God that we serve today. Keep in mind, a God, a holy God who sacrifices his own son on our behalf will certainly not withhold anything from us. He is there to help us and protect us and keep us and a great Baptist the, the, a great Baptist theology here is after God has done all of this for us to make a way for us to be saved, how can we really lose our salvation? How can we become unsaved? We cannot. Once God has made that change in our life, once we have accepted Jesus Christ, we have that assurance and that salvation. God by nature is a giving God and we should thank him for that each and every day. Up until, up until this point in, in scripture verses 31 and 32 in chapter 8 we should recognize that Paul has repeatedly emphasized the troubles of this world. He never said that as Christians we would be shielded from it. He talks about the opposition of the flesh. He talks about sin. And he even talks about the trouble with the law with some believers. And Paul is declaring that no matter, it's not so much what is against us as it is who is for us. And I think we need to be reminded of that today. As we live this sinful, live in this sinful world with our sinful nature among thorns, amongst, amongst sickness, amongst catastrophes and disasters that we can't uh, explain, the, uh, the, the, the sudden shock of a death of a loved one or a tragic accident that takes, that takes our children and our family members away, it's not so much what's against us as it is who is for us. And that is God himself. Yes, he is for us. Sometimes, indeed, our opposition is great. Sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes it feels like that things are greater at times against us. The world, the flesh, Satan, uh, the secular world. False religious, we talked about that Sunday, and our enemies, but we need to be reminded of today that God is for us, that he loves us, he is sovereign, he is our shepherd, and he is the maker of heaven and earth. May we never forget the power that God holds, and his intention is to take care of his children, and his intentions are promises that he has always kept. Let's go, in, go into a few more verses. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? 
It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That is you and I, the Christian. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. Paul reminds us in verses 33 through 36 that our accusers and our enemies are many, but God has already cast judgment. He has already declared his plans for us, and he has already pronounced a final verdict. And Paul is asking this ridiculous question, who would dare bring charges against God's chosen? Who would dare stand up against the creator of heaven and earth? Who would dare stand up against a holy God who has proven himself over and over again? The term there in verse 33, it is God who justifies. That word justifies is a Greek legal term. And what it means is to be acquitted or vindicated. So God has acquitted us, those Christians who have asked Jesus Christ into our life. And he has cleared the way for us for salvation and a ticket to heaven. Christ's death accomplished the justification of the believer. And it is only by his death, his sacrificial death, a sinless man on a cruel cross, that that is available to you and I. It is God himself who makes man righteous. There is no higher court. There is no higher being than God. And we need to recognize that. That if God be for us, who can be against us? The statement in verse 30, 34, many translations consider this a statement and not so much a question. Who is it who condemns? Well, we know from the book of John, chapter 12, verse 47, that Christ did not come to judge the world, but he come to save it. So with that information in mind, the question almost becomes a statement, will Christ condemn us? And the answer is no, he came to save us. He died for us. Matter of fact, the glorified Christ is at the right hand of God, God interceding for us as is the Spirit. We have these promises to live by each and every day. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of what God's Word says and stand upon those promises that rock solid faith that we have been talking about for the last three Sundays here at Crossroads Baptist Church. As Christians, we can be assured that no one, that no one will be able to condemn us because. I want to give you three things that, that give us this, this, uh, this reminder or this promise. And the first is that Christ died for us. He died for all mankind. He died for the Christian. He died for the non-Christian, though all will not accept him. Christ died for us. The second thing is, more than that, he was raised from the dead. Scripture tells us this over and over again. He died for us, but more than that, he was raised from the dead. And even now, the great reminder is that he loves us and he is making intercession for us at the right hand of God. Then in verse 35 and 36, Paul does something that he is already very accustomed to. Pain and disappointment, suffering. He begins to list these things to remind us. Let me read this and let me make a statement about it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This great love that we have just laid out. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or storm, sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. And Paul gives us these disasters and none of which can separate us from the love of Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. Persecution drives the true believer actually into the arms of a loving God. One who knows all about suffering. It pushes us into the arms of a loving Father. Though Satan would tend for it to do the opposite, through faith it moves us closer to a, a more dependent relationship on our Father. As these disasters are powerless to affect the love of Christ. Does it sometimes affect us? Of course it does, but these great promises and reminders here, we should hold dear to our heart. We can take these scriptures to say 
not what, but who, is stronger than God. Famine, nakedness, danger, sword, that's death or persecution. Well, nothing is. No one is greater than God. And I, that Paul gives us those things to remind us that we are not fighting as an underdog. We're fighting as a, as a victor. Even among trouble and tribulation and strong pressure, destitute, nakedness, if you will, the sword or execution or persecution, Paul never said that we were, we were above these things, that the chosen or the predestined would not suffer these things because indeed we do because we're of a sinful nature and we're living in a sinful world. But what Paul did say is that these things cannot separate us from the love of God. Simply saying in verse 36, he says, look at scripture. This is nothing new. You, you today, as we go through trials and tribulations and uncertainties and unexpected uh, tragic events, this is nothing new to mankind. This has been taking place since the fall of man. And he just simply reminds us, just simply read God's word and be reminded of his promises. In verse 36, he says, as it is written. In other words, in God's word, for your sake, you face death all day long. Do we not? <clears throat> I often wonder sometimes how we get from point A to point B in our vehicles and we make it safely with so many people on the road at the speeds we go and with the dangers that, that are all around us. It is by God's grace and we need to be reminded that we are indeed considered as sheep to the slaughter. Let me read a few more of these verses. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The troubles to be faced by the Christian are nothing new. They have always been the experience of God's people. What we're going through today is nothing new. Whatever the trial or tribulation may be in your life, it's nothing new. And Paul reminds us of that. At every moment of the day, we are facing death. We are not promised our next breath. We're not promised to finish this devotion. We're not promised to wake up tomorrow. Each and every day we face death. We're considered no better than sheep in line for the slaughter. Nevertheless, in all these difficult situations, we are on the winning team, and we are winning an overwhelming victory through the one who has proven his great love for you and I. That's what Paul is telling us here today. He lists these things not so much to remind us what we're going to go through, but as a testimony of the things that God's people and you and I have already been through. God is good, and he takes care of his people. It is the love of Christ that supports and enables the believer to face the adversities and to conquer them. And then finally, he tells us in verse 38 and 39, as I just read, this is rather a reflection, just as I shared, not so much an interpretation of what's to come, though they will. It is a reflection or a confidence in who God is and what God has done. It is a, a trigger to remind us of how good God is. Shutting the church down for a couple weeks is the responsible thing to do, I believe. But it's not always the easy thing to do. It's not the popular thing to do. And it makes many believers question, you know, decision making and, and, and perhaps, you know, the, 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 the leadership of the church. But let me, let me remind you that it is a reminder here that we have confidence in a holy God. That by saying these things, that neither... Uh, angel, nor demon, nor death, nor life, nor uh, neither the present nor the future, or any powers or within the earth, anything, height or depth, or anything within all creation, nothing should take away our confidence that God continues to be faithful. And by stating these things and having that reflection on who God is, it is an act of praise that we know God will see us through it. And that's my testimony today. This is a list of 10 things, 10 terms, from the physical danger to those supernatural powers that we face today.
that those that exist today or ever will exist, the powers from high or the powers from low or anything else in God's whole world, nothing can separate us from the great love of God. You want to know what Paul's talking about in chapter 8 of the book of Romans? He's talking about a love that God has for his children. And it is a great reminder that he is faithful, that he keeps his promises, and he takes care of his own. No matter what comes our way, Paul has uh, included all of it in this chapter. No matter what comes our way, for the Christian today, God is on our side. Be reminded of that today. And the great sacrifices that God has made for us to have salvation. And if God would do all of that, forsaking his own son, if God would do all of that, why should we fear today or tomorrow? God is there beside us. Thank you for joining me for this midweek devotion. Keep in mind on your calendar, August 8th will be our next devotion. It will be a, a Sunday morning uh, Bible study. I'll, I'll be here with you Sunday and we'll, we'll, we'll go back and we perhaps we'll look at Romans chapter 9. We'll just wait and see where the Lord leads between now and then. Thank you for joining me. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your promises. Lord, you take care of your people, Lord, and we love you for that. Lord, thank you for the reminders today in Romans chapter 8 of who you are, of your son Jesus, the sacrifice that has been made for the, for the Christian and for all the world who will accept your son Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And to be reminded today that though we sometimes face opposition, Lord, nothing is greater than you. You are the final say-so. You are the final court. Lord, thank you for these reminders today. Lord, bless the hearer of this word. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Be with the needs in our church and in our communities and within our families. Lord, be with Brother Randy as he travels to Peru. Take care of him. And Lord, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today.